It's the week ending Friday the 2nd of August and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days we've seen a 17-year-old charged over a frenzied stabbing attack that left three young girls dead in Merseyside, the assassination of key leaders of Hamas and Hezbollah by Israel, and US gymnast Simone Biles winning her fifth gold medal at the Olympic Games. You can read all you need to know about everything that matters in The Week magazine, but we're here to bring you some stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Marion McNichol, let's unwrap the week. And with Ollie still on holiday, joining me today from the week's digital team, it's Rebecca Evans and Harriet Marsden and, and host of the award-winning Integrate That podcast, Abdul Wahab Tahan. And Abdul, with Olympic fever gripping the world this week, my question to you is, if you had to choose something to compete in, what would your Olympic sport of choice be? Well, being a refugee, I would definitely choose shooting. <laughs> I think mine would be something as unathletic as possible, sort of in the vein of shooting, something like curling or being the cox in a rowing event or something. But anyway, uh, Harriet, I hope you're limbering up because you're up first. What do you think this week should be remembered for? A new hope for sepsis patients. <laughs> And I was thinking to myself, oh, I even had my vaccine, the flu, <laughs> but here I am with the flu. And I think it was within about the first week, eventually I was on the floor of uh, my ensuite toilets in the bedroom, couldn't get up, had to call my wife and my son to try and come and help me, to move me. He couldn't move me and I just, just couldn't move. And at that point, of course, we called the NHS 24, then an ambulance was called, and, you know, that's it all began. Moray MSP Richard Lockhead speaking to the press and journal there about his experience with sepsis. Harriet, what happened to Lockhead and how does his experience connect to the news this week? Uh, so he he fell ill and, and thought he was coming down with the flu, which is very common for um, what actually ended up being the case, which was that he had sepsis, which um, meant that he was rushed to hospital. He had to have emergency heart surgery and the infection left him unable to talk for weeks. He had to relearn to walk. Now, he should be returning to Scottish Parliament after recess ends, but the, the interesting coincidence, and I'm not sure if he actually knew this when he was giving the interview. I'm not sure when the interview was given, but it was published last Friday. But last Wednesday, there was a, a big study published in a journal that is um, describing this massive breakthrough in terms of treating sepsis. It's this new technology being developed in South Korea that would massively reduce the time it takes to identify the right antibiotic treatment for the bacteria causing the sepsis. So it's a breakthrough in sepsis testing, right? What was the test and what are its implications? Okay, so basically with sepsis, a quick antibiotic prescription is really, really, really essential, obviously, to reduce the very high fatality rate and the chance of severe complications like Richard Lockhead experienced. But also very important is the right antibiotic prescription. So at the moment, to treat sepsis sufferers, you basically have to pump them filled with different types of antibiotics or a broad spectrum antibiotic to try and find the right one to treat the bacteria that causes the infection. Meanwhile, you're doing this very lengthy test. I won't go into too much detail about that currently, but the culture medium test, which is where you basically take blood and analyze the strain of bacteria that causes the sepsis and try different antibiotics to see which one will work. The new approach would basically bypass that step. So it would still take a blood sample, but effectively it would massively, massively speed up that process in order to find the right antibiotic that would treat the infection because you can identify what the actual DNA structure is of the bacteria causing the infection. And the study, it suggests that this new technology could cut the time that it, by about 30 to 40 hours, so down to 12 hours, it was, it's an enormous, enormous difference because every single second is crucial when it comes to treating sepsis. But this very lengthy process, the lengthy process, which also massively contributes to the rise of antibiotic resistance, which we can discuss more later, but is basically one of the biggest threats to humanity. Because if you're treating 
the sepsis infection with the wrong type of antibiotic or broad spectrum antibiotics, you are increasing the risk that that person or that bacteria strain will become resistant to antibiotics because they're not effective. Okay, so lots to dig into here. And perhaps we'll f- at first park the whole business of antibiotic resistance. But Rebecca, first of all, what is sepsis and how serious a problem is it? So sepsis is essentially the consequence of a serious complication of an infection. So I'm sure we've all had some sort of infection within our lives, but sepsis is slightly different in the sense that the immune system usually can can keep an infection limited to one place. And it does that by producing white blood cells, which travel to the infection site, destroy the germs that um, cause the infection. But if the immune system is weak or if an infection is particularly severe, it can spread to other parts of the body. And, and it's that widespread inflammation that white blood cells can't necessarily tackle that can ultimately interfere with, with blood flow, stop oxygen reaching organs and tissues in the body. And obviously that has a, a, a real drastic impact in the, the most serious cases, sepsis can lead to death. You know, at least 245,000 people are affected in Britain with sepsis and at least 48,000 people die from sepsis-related illnesses every year, um, according to the UK Sepsis Trust. I mean, those stats in themselves are astounding. You know, at the rates we're talking about, that probably means most of us has either had it or will have it or knows someone who's had it. Why are sepsis cases rising so quickly, Abdul? Well, there are a number of, of uh, reasons why sepsis um, arises quickly because of the lack of diagnosis, for example, because the, the symptoms of sepsis are very common. So they include slurred speech or uh, confusion extreme shivering of the muscles, and a lot of people would think that this is a cold or a flu, so you would be misdiagnosed. And these symptoms, the mo- the longer they're misdiagnosed, the more serious they get. The official advice in the NHS is that you spot, if you spot any symptoms, you have to go and see a GP or an A&E. And, you know, taking, seeing a GP in, in England nowadays is going to take, what, like two weeks? And waiting, I gather, is one of the problems, Harriet, isn't it? That, you know, the reason why sepsis can be problematic for so many people is because it takes a while before they even know what sepsis, let alone what kind of treatment will treat them best. But this test is meant to help with that. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly why it's being described as this incredible game changer to the point where the the company the, the company behind the new technology their share price spiked like thirty percent the day after this study was published. Um, so as Rebecca was saying, the mortality rate of sepsis is kind of somewhere between twenty to fifty percent. So it's an extraordinarily high mortality rate. It's more than ten million deaths worldwide a year. It's actually the leading cause of avoidable deaths in the world. Um, but even those who do survive, about 40% suffer severe after effects because it takes such a long time, A, to diagnose, because as Rebecca and Abdul were both saying, the symptoms look like any other infection, uh, but also there's no one diagnostic test. There are multiple different tests that can be done and observation to get a broader picture to then lead to a diagnosis of sepsis. Um, But then the delivery of the right antibiotic quickly is really, really crucial. The problem with sepsis though, is that often it's only really diagnosed when people end up in intensive care with like multiple organ failure because they were admitted with a chest infection and that they thought it was just pneumonia. The problems in the NHS, which are well-trodden ground for this podcast, you know, the difficulty in getting GP appointments, face-to-face GP appointments are actually impossible um, at my GP. Um, The massive waiting times in A&E, the shortages of staff, All of these things, as well as improvements to diagnosis, are contributing to the rise in diagnosis of cases. Yeah. I mean, and yet we still obviously are struggling at the moment with the problem of sepsis not being treated quickly enough. And there was one case in particular that has contributed to a massive change in the traditional culture of deference, as it's called, towards doctors at some hospitals. You go in there, you expect them to know what they're doing, and often they will leave people to their own devices. Rebecca, what was that case and what did it result in? Sure. Well, we've seen with Richard Lockhead how the NHS can be absolutely instrumental in saving lives, but things don't 
as you say, always go right. And and I think that's most relevant, as you say, in the case of Martha Mills. Um, she was a 13-year-old girl who died in 2021 after developing sepsis in hospital. Uh, she'd first been admitted with a pancreatic injury after falling off her bike, of all things. But her family's concerns about her deteriorating condition uh, weren't really responded to in the best way. Uh, they couldn't get a second opinion. She quickly deteriorated and sadly died as a result of the sepsis that that, that took over her body. A coroner ruled in, in 2023 that, that she probably would have survived if she'd been moved to intensive care earlier and had the, the diagnosis of sepsis been taken perhaps more seriously than it, than it had. So her death was obviously very sad, but it hasn't been in vain because her parents have campaigned for this really impactful and important rule uh, named after Martha, Martha's rule. And it's a new scheme that allows patients and their families to seek that urgent review if their medical condition deteriorates. Um, This is a a new escalation process that's going to be available or is available now 24-7 to patients families and and NHS staff. It's quickly and easily accessible, or it should be if it works correctly. Um, And it's been described as one of the most important changes to patient care in recent years. So hopefully that rule will help with the diagnosis of sepsis and other uh, serious and life-threatening conditions, and hopefully go a long way into helping people make the recovery that they need. Listen, I don't want to say that we don't consistently fulfill our brief on this show of uncovering three new stories with massive repercussions for all our lives every single week. But Harriet, I really think that you might genuinely have risen to that challenge this week. This feels really big and underreported, but there is also a way that this breakthrough may help in humanity's mega battle against antibiotic resistant superbugs too. What is that exactly? Yeah, so I'll 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 come to that in a second, but first I'll I'll just mention that the reason that I know about sepsis is actually because I have a personal connection to it. My cousin, I call her my little cousin in my head, but she's in her 20s now. Um she nearly died of sepsis in the first year of the pandemic. Um she was extraordinarily ill and they were desperately trying to they did eventually diagnose sepsis, but they were trying to find the source of the infection with all these different an- antibiotics in order to treat it. And because they weren't working, that's why she ended up in the ICU and that's why she ended up so incredibly unwell. Um and also we've got a member of our team, Irene, who made our her podcast debut a couple of weeks ago, she also was incredibly ill with sepsis when she was about 11. And she was on broad spectrum antibiotics for about a week, but they didn't work because they weren't targeting correctly the bacteria causing the sepsis. So she was just pumped on a drip filled with antibiotics for about a week. Um, she was also, her, her GP wanted to send her back to school because the symptoms in children are actually very different in adults. They don't look the same and about half of all sepsis cases are kids. They're under fives. So it's really important that even though everyone has heard about the symptoms for adults, they also need to learn that the symptoms for children are very different and very common looking. But in terms of the what you mentioned, the biggest one of the biggest threats to humanity, which is antibiotic resistant bacteria, i.e. bacteria that has become immune to treatment with antibiotics. The connection with sepsis is that antibiotics are the only effective treatment really for it. Yeah, so antibiotic resistance was was responsible for like 1.2 million deaths globally in 2019. And the projections, the projections are really scary. It's very much on the rise. The World Health Organization said that it could easily evolve into a global health crisis on par with the pandemic, that could potentially surpass cancer-related deaths in the next few years. So the problem is that the long turnaround time for the current sex sepsis diagnosis testing technology that we've got, that really long turnaround time actually directly contributes to the development of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Because if all of the drugs that are being prescribed to sepsis sufferers, they're unnecessary or ineffective, and that is a significant proportion, those bacteria are have much, much more likely to become resistant to antibiotics. I mean, nearly, I think nearly 40% of E. coli bacteria, which has been in the news a lot with the Olympics and the Sen, nearly 40% of E. coli bacteria, which accounts for about a third of all sepsis cases, is currently resistant to antibiotics. We're already in a really, really bad state of antibiotic resistance. And we also don't really want to run out of the 
antibiotics that do work. We don't want to be prescribing the incorrect antibiotic to treat the sepsis, which is what is currently the case because the testing takes so long. This culture test that we were talking about earlier takes such a long time. In the meantime, you're pumping people with sepsis filled with antibiotics that may or may not be working. So there's kind of three different problems there. We're running out of the antibiotics that do work. The bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics are on the rise. And also both the sepsis directly contributes to both things and makes it worse because it's so difficult to diagnose. But not only that, it's also because it's so difficult to treat. So that's where this new game-changing technology would directly lower the fatality rate of sepsis and also stop it contributing to this rising threat of antibiotic resistance. Yeah, the good news aspect of this story is that the timeline for this new test's arrival in the real world uh, is looking pretty hopeful. How long until we might see this saving lives in hospitals in the UK and beyond? Researchers think it could be ready to be used in clinics in two to three years. And um, at the same time, we can talk about this this other ongoing study that's happening in London at the moment, this year-long study that was launched uh, last autumn. Indeed. A genuinely underreported story of pretty big significance. No pressure, Rebecca, but you're up next after this. Okay, Rebecca, it's your turn. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Do MPs really have their head in the game? Because like you say, I don't see how on earth you're able to fit in all these additional hours, particularly when you're including potentially international travel at times, to be able to do your job as a member of parliament, which I can tell you from first-hand experience is just non-stop relentless, not just with doing your own casework, not with just trying to be out and about in your community, but also trying to fit in time to even just campaign so you're prepared for when the next general election comes and you've built some incumbency, as we would call it. Former Deputy Chairperson of the Conservative Party, Jonathan Gullis, talking to Alex Phillips on Talk TV there. Rebecca, what was the story this week? Well, this week, research found that at least 12 Tory MPs decided to set up their own consultancy firms in preparation for their election defeat. Now, while there's no suggestion of wrongdoing on the the part of these MPs, I think it raises interesting questions about how these individuals use their platform. And the reason I brought this story this week, I think it's particularly interesting, as it's perhaps passed slightly more under the radar than the recently announced government decision to crack down on MPs having second jobs. And I think the two issues might be more related than we think in terms of the culture and the wider culture of the Commons. Okay, so on the first point then, some outgoing MPs set up consultancies. I mean, the writing was on the wall for a lot of Tories at the last election. Doesn't it make sense for at least some of them to have been thinking about their future after politics? Sure, I think no one can really dispute the fact that it's it's probably a sensible idea to undertake forward planning. I mean, these are MMPs are, are people at the end of the day, they've got families, some of them have young families to consider. Um, but to me, it's easy to get the sense that these political representatives perhaps don't have their head in the game as much as they should. They seem to be kind of constantly hedging their bets on the opportunities that might be available to them outside the central role of being an MP, whether that's during their tenure or uh, shortly subsequent to their tenure. Abdul, there's no actual formal job description to be an MP. How professionally demanding is it in reality? You know, does the job require long hours or is it actually pretty cushy? Uh, Well, it depends on what you make out of it. If you're like Nigel Farage, then you're kind of probably going to the US and going here and there to represent your own interests and uh, create a lot of uh, photo opportunities for a lot of different people and not really caring about your constituent. And it depends. And there are some of the MPs who really work very, very hard for their people. And and the problem is there are this kind of so far, there's no guidelines for what MPs can and cannot do. But the new uh, Labour government wants to organize that and want to ban MPs from having a second job that is not related to serving their own community. And rightly so, because a lot of a lot of them they hold some jobs as consultants for oil companies. While it's it's not in a conflict of interest for his constituents, but it raises a lot of ethical questions of whether he would be serving the people who elected him 
or he, would he be serving his own uh, businesses and uh, agenda? Harriet, what sorts of businesses are they and are they legitimate as far as we know? Well, that's that's the interesting question because it's really not clear. And quite a few of these MPs actually declined to respond to the Guardian's request for comment. Uh, Marcus Fish, though, who... Um, so he incorporated an, an IT tech consultancy, and he said that it was set up to handle some of the investments that he'd been making in artificial intelligence. Uh, the uh, the only Labour MP on the list, actually, Khalid Mahmood, um, set up a, a consultancy called Strategic Solu- KN Strategic Solutions, which he said was to deal with his, um, he's going to be receiving fees as a senior fellow of a think tank of, of policy exchange. Now that's completely legal to incorporate a company to, as a freelancer, to receive your payments and minimize the tax that you pay on them. Totally legal. There are two strands here. Firstly, MPs setting up, prepping for after life after MPs or MPs having second jobs while they're MPs. And to the first strand, I mean, as Rebecca mentioned, you know, that yes, they they stand to lose their quite lucrative, I think it's 86,000 uh, a year currently salary overnight. But former MPs who lose their seats at the election or some sometimes who don't even stand as uh, for election are entitled to quite a lot of payments already. You know, I mean, it's not like they just get thrown out on the street without a crust. Like there's three types of payments. There's loss of office payment, uh, something called winding up funds and a winding up payment, which is a different type of thing. So winding up budget is for various costs like closing down their constituency office. The winding up payment is calculated based on four months uh, net salary and to help them with financial support. And then there's a loss of office payment if they had held office for at least two years when they lose the seat. So let's just be really clear. MPs who lose their seats or don't stand at the election are not getting sent out with nothing, generally speaking. To the second strand, whether or not MPs should have time for other work, especially when they're campaigning, it's an interesting one because there's two aspects. Whether or not it's a neglect of their democratic duties, whether they should be busy with their constituents or busy with campaigning or busy with the full-time job of being an MP, and also whether or not it constitutes a corruption of their democratic duties. Like, as Abdul was saying, kind of a lot of issues to, around lobbying and conflict of interests and who they go on to work for, and what they might have done to make them sort of appealing to those companies while they were MPs, what interests they might have parlayed into parliament. Like it's, it's a really, really, really thorny issue. And it's, it's been one that's, I think, dominated the news cycle since the Owen Patterson scandal of a few years ago, which was one of the big nails in Boris Johnson's coffin. But I do think that the figures though, just one figure that I'm going to tell people, a new, a new accounts tool, a Westminster accounts tool was set up last year by Tortoise and Sky News to kind of collect all the information about MPs second jobs. MPs raked in more than 17 million from second jobs over the pre- previous 3 years. We're not talking chicken change here. Do you know what I mean? It's this is a lot this is a lot a lot of money. And um I mean Abdul also mentioned Nigel Farage well some of his kind of cronies earn an incredible incredible amount of money appearing on GB news presenting news shows which um you know a lot of people including the media watchdog ofcom would argue is a massive massive no no but they have earned a fortune so i think for anyone listening at home needs to get a sense of just how much money we're talking about we're not talking about that uh, like an mp for example that has a second job as an nhs nurse Yeah. I mean, one of the things that people say is politicians are driven to take on this extra work because they're not being paid enough. And, you know, a job that's in the, what did you say, 80, 90,000 a year range will sound pretty tempting to many of us. But the argument is often made that people have had to drop down from their high-flying corporate career to enter this humble world of political representation. I mean, Rebecca, is it true that you could stamp out at least some of this problem if you gave bigger salaries to MPs to stop them seeking out extra work? 
they've had to drop down from like high flying paying roles into being an MP. Excuse me while I get out my tiny violin. Um, <laughs> I just I, being an MP is a choice, right? I mean, the central motivation for a lot of people is that that become MPs or that they they want to help out their their communities, and I think that's very admirable. But there's no denying that b- being an MP, clearly from what we can see about people setting up their consultancy firms, either um, outside of, of once they've left becoming an MP or the kind of work that they're doing on the on the side whilst being an MP, that's an incredibly fortunate and lucrative position. If you're a consultant, you're advising business on how to steer their way around parliament. That to me feels like selling your influence. It feels like trading off your position as an MP. Obviously, not all MPs are doing that. And there's plenty of MPs who are flying under the radar, trying to do the best for their constituents and just keeping their head down. So in that sense, potentially that I can see the argument that, that, that could be made that MPs need to have more um, more compensation, particularly in such a fraught political time where MPs are arguably putting their lives on the line in, in some situations. They're getting paid a fair amount. I mean, I don't think anyone could say they're not. There's the slightly comedic case that's often cited of George Osborne, who was famously editor of London's Evening Standard newspaper, an advisor at BlackRock, chairman of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, and a fellow at the McCain Institute, all while being an MP. Abdul, should MPs be allowed to have second jobs, or indeed fifth or sixth jobs like George Osborne, while they're in Parliament? Well, Arian, it's a very simple question. If you have a full-time job, are you allowed to have a second part-time job while you're having your first full-time job? The answer is no. I cannot have a second job or a third or a fourth job while I work at university, for example. At the university, they're telling me, what the hell are you doing? You sh- you're supposed to be teaching students. And this is simple as simple as this. You know, you, if, you're, if you're committed, you're a full-time uh, MP, you should be a full-time MP serving your own constituents. And that's as simple as that. So I don't think there is any 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 argument unless your, your other job is, you know, you're writing your own biography because you're a narcissist and want everyone to know about your life. Harriet, what is Labour trying to do about all this? Well, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned Labour because I think also a really key point here is that the massive amount of money being earned by MPs in terms of second jobs is massively overrepresented on the conservative side. That's not that's not a biased thing to say that as a matter of public record that it's overwhelmingly may or may not be because they were the ruling party of government is overwhelmingly a Tory problem. The new Labour government wants to put forward this legislation that would basically tighten up the rules on what work members of the Commons are allowed to do outside of their work as an MP. So not banning second jobs, but just very much clarify that there is a big difference between a full-time second job, like working at the Evening Standard as an editor, let's say, even though he was never there, by the way, because I was there at the same time as him. <laughs> Scandal. Um, and um, big difference between that and someone who may or may not be uh, doing kind of part-time freelancing, like Abdul used the example of writing your memoirs, your biography. So this new legislation, which was actually approved by the Commons last week, it would stop MPs from taking on second jobs that don't meet this test, this test, which is, does it still let them put constituents first? Um, and it would allow them to give speeches and broadcast work on a case-by-case basis. It's a slightly watered-down version of what Labour and originally Jeremy Corbyn actually had, had proposed. It's a really interesting issue in terms of public opinion, because the public opinion is, by and large, that MPs shouldn't have the time for other work anyway, but also that they worry about the impact it has on their independent as an MP. Like Rebecca was saying, former MPs are given grace and favour parliamentary passes that give them access to all the restaurants, and bars and everything in Westminster where you can just grab someone, have a little word here, have a word there. And you're not allowed to use your pass in this way, but there was no proper like lobbying register. So it basically went unenforced. But it's a really, really, really thorny issue. And I think that it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in terms of this uh, this second jobs with this new legislation but it is worth noting though that this is ha- this has been previously by and large a tory problem i can't let your criticism of george osborne go unchallenged because you know the man had four other jobs to attend to he didn't have time to always be in your office harriet 
Like I honestly thought, I honestly thought he had about ten <laughs> jobs. But I think any anyone who's ever worked in news could say sometimes to the detriment of everyone's health and sanity, a newspaper editor job is a full time <laughs> job. And the Evening Standard is the most was anyway was the most important paper in the most important city in the UK. So. <laughs> Okay. Now, Rebecca, I'm not trying to defend the 12 people who set up consultancies before their elected work was done, but politics is a profession with an unusual degree of job uncertainty because every four or five years, you come up for a performance review. And it isn't just about your performance, it's about your entire team as well. And you could lose your job because everyone around you is doing a bad job. So isn't it understandable that people hedge their professional bets a little bit? I think we all potentially hedge professional bets bets to a certain extent like no one is no one is saying that you can't prepare for the next thing that might happen in your life whether that's you know professionally or personally it just the whole thing just seems morally gray to me we've had so much sleaze and cronyism and scandal across both major parties you know and so many lobbying scandals particularly Cameron and Green Cell Capital cash for questions cash for access Owen Patterson all of these things just have created this environment within within um within the commons particularly that just rubs people up the wrong way it certainly rubs me up the wrong way and I just feel like there is a certain amount of forward planning but when it feels as if it's all been nefariously done behind the scenes and they've always got one eye on their personal issues and one eye on their constituency it just feels as if to me what does that really say about how they feel about the members of their constituency as the bottom line? Well, my second job starts promptly after this recording, so I'm going to have to move us smartly along to our next topic. Abdul, you're up next after this. Abdul, you're finishing the show. What do you think this week should be remembered for? It was the wrong song, but the right spirit. And now, the national anthem of South Sudan. Mesdames, Messieurs, nous nous excusons pour l'erreur technique. Ladies and gentlemen, we apologize for the technical error. The moment the South Sudan basketball team made their debut at the Olympics. Abdul, what are we listening to here exactly? So we were listening to a mistake. The South Sudanese team was playing in the Olympics their first time they play basketball in the Olympics and the organizers played the wrong national anthem. They played the national anthem of Sudan, not South Sudan. Now, South Sudan was formed in 2011 after years of uh, civil war and people didn't like it. The players looked confused. It was very disrespectful. Uh, but uh, according to the French, uh, it was a human error and they apologized for it. Of course, uh, South Sudan went on to win their first Olympic game. Uh, defeat in Puerto Rico, 1979. Why I brought this story up, it might seem insignificant, but to me, uh, I found it very significant because uh, all over the media, I was reading about how this team is an inspiration to, to South Sudan, an inspiration to African and, and this and that. And I thought, oh my God, these players must have been living through war. And then I checked and 10 players out of 12 foreign nationals of the United States, Canada and Australia. Some of them are born and raised abroad. They never lived a day in their lives in South Sudan. And then on, 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 on the media and press conferences, they talk about how difficult it is in Sudan, South Sudan and living in South Sudan. And, you know, I was like, give me a break. I moved from Syria to the UK and it was a dream come true. You know, <laughs> but to be fair, I mean, the reason that some of these players have an association with another country is, as you say, because 
they are refugees. It's not so surprising that they may still feel a connection to the place where, in many cases, they were born. But uh, if not, they still have deep family connections. Shouldn't they still, you know, isn't it logical that they might want to represent South Sudan? Well, it, it, I, it's very interesting because had they been successful and really good, they would have represented the country where they live and work. For example, they would have represented the United States, Canada, and Australia, the better teams playing and having a better chance. But a number of these athletes who can who cannot really play for the better team, they choose to play for the second team or less famous team. For example, the gymnast representing Syria, the Syrian team, they have, uh, I think, uh, six players. And one of them was uh, playing for a gymnast, was born and raised in the U.S., and now represents Syria. Never lived a day in his life in Syria. Doesn't know what's it like to queue for to buy bread or uh, to go to school uh, with 50 other kids, you know. And then they go and represent Syria and represent a very bad and, and a dictatorship kind of government wearing the T-shirt with Assad's photo printed and talking about, you know, how great Syria is and giving uh, validation to such a country. But the media eats this story. They love this kind of story. And that's what uh, kind of pissed me off a little bit. <laughs> Here we are, the media, eating this story up. Harriet, is it common for people to represent a country that they don't have a lifelong connection with? And what are the rules at the Olympics about which country you're meant to represent? As the author of one of these stories that apparently the media is eating up, I'm going to have to pull you up <laughs> on a couple of things there. So firstly, just a little bit of background. Um, in terms of the rules, by the way, they're not breaking any of the rules to be representing South Sudan. So South Sudan actually gained independence from Sudan after a referendum in 2011, which makes it the world's youngest country, actually. Um, but it's still, it's since suffered one of the, the longest civil wars on record. More than 4 million people have been displaced, nearly half a million people killed. It's the fourth lowest GDP in the world uh, after Afghanistan and Syria. These players they're actually so good that some of them do play for the NBA. It's because they're so good, but there aren't the resources in South Sudan to support the development of players, although that is changing. But Sudan, South Sudan has become one of the most incredible exporters of basketball talent in, in the whole world. It's sent players to the NBA. This team, the Bright Stars, the top ranking team in Africa, which is how they gained a spot in the Olympics. And they're so good that at a warm-up match in London, they really, really nearly beat the US by a, by a very long margin. The US basketball team is the best in the world. It's got actual like, legends on it, like LeBron James, who's the one whose late bucket cost South Sudan the match. They lost by one point in this warm-up match. Just to be clear, these players are not playing for South Sudan because they are not good enough to play anywhere else. Most of the squad were actually born in Sudan or South Sudan, depending on when they were born and when Sudan, South Sudan existed. Uh, others were born in refugee camps in Kenya, Ethiopia, uh, Uganda, and they were relocated as children to the US, to Canada, to Australia and other countries. Whether or not they're good enough to be there is not in dispute. There's absolutely no rules being broken here at all. These players all have every conceivable right to be representing South Sudan. But in terms of the what I think Abdul is getting at in terms of the the moral and ethical question and dynamics there, I think that's far more thorny. And I think as we're going to discuss, it's also been a massive point of contention about Russian athletes competing in the Olympics. Well, just before we get to Russia, many of the South Sudanese players, as we've been saying, were refugees in early life, but they now potentially have a country to return to, afflicted as it still is by instability. But many people don't, which is why the International Olympic Committee created the refugee team in 2016. Rebecca, how does the refugee team work and how do you qualify for it? So to be eligible for the refugee team, it simply says that athletes are required to be elite competitors in their respective sport, but they also need to be refugees in their host country. And that's something that needs to be recognized by the UNCHR and the UN Refugee Agency. So this year for the uh, Paris 2024 Olympics, the refugee team 
is once again official and made up of about 37 um, athletes. But obviously that that team is representative of more than 100 million forcibly displaced people worldwide. Now, I'm sure Abdul will obviously have opinions on, on the refugee team and the kind of inner workings of that. But on a surface level, just from what I'm seeing as a kind of outsider, I think it's great that refugees get to participate in this way, particularly because so many of these athletes have been through so much and experienced things that, that no one should ever have to. Abdul, I do know that you have strong opinions on this. What are your strong opinions? <laughs> Enlighten us. Well, there are a number of issues on the refugee team. One of them is it's very political. It's good for media. It's great uh, press for the press. Look, we have unity. We have a, a, a inclusion and diversity. But then it's all political. Who gets selected? It's just by a, an, an invitation, just like getting an, um, invited to go to Harry Potter school. You know, an owl gives you an invitation and that's it. You know, it's all done in secret. For example, this year for the cycling, they decided to go with um, uh, Afghan refugees. Um, why? I don't know. I have no idea. Again, they don't, they don't um, explain this. This is number one. Number two, as Rebecca pointed out, you need to be recognized as a refugee in order to qualify. And a lot of people are not, especially those people who, for example, live in Turkey and they do not have official refugees uh, status and they live under protection, humanitarian protection. Who represents these people? Uh, you know. And after a couple of years, these refugees are going to be citizens. I arrived in England as a refugee. I'm not talented enough to, to do any sports. And now I'm a British citizen, right? So if, if I were talented enough, I would be representing team uh, GP, right? But and all of these uh, athletes are going to represent their country unless they're not good enough. Again, a, a point that I uh, disagree with Harriet. And then they would go and represent their own uh, dictatorship countries, the one they fled and never lived a day in their lives. And some of them don't even speak the language of the country they represent in, in the case of Qatar or UAE in a lot of different countries. So these are some of my controversial opinions. Uh, well, you're right. Everyone is trying to represent their country or their chosen country. But one nation that no one can represent at the Olympics, as you mentioned, Harriet, is Russia. When did that start and how long is it likely to last? Yeah, so this is this is where the question of whether or not sport is political gets really, really, really interesting. So originally, the Olympic Committee actually banned Russian athletes and Belarusian athletes because Belarus is such a staunch ally of Russia, banned them from competing but then it kind of accepted the Kremlin's argument that sport is above politics. So it ruled in December that it would be unfair to punish the athletes based on their passports. So it kind of created this like a loophole, effectively. Uh, Russians and Belarusians, without any connection to either military, they are allowed to compete as individual neutral athletes in neutral uniforms, but they have to be vetted to make sure they haven't publicly supported the war. Um, when that happened, when that ruling came through in December, Ukraine actually threatened to boycott the Olympics. Um, and hundreds of Ukrainian athletes wrote to Macron, uh, urging him to, to bar Russian and Belarusian participants. And since then, that they've kind of said, okay, they'll participate. They're sending 140 athletes to the Olympics themselves. But many of their athletes, actually like 400 of their athletes have been killed by it, many of them in combat against Russia. And there's a significant chance that they might, Russian and Ukrainian athletes might actually be facing each other at the Olympics, in which case the Ukrainian chiefs have kind of given all this, this advice that they can't shake their hands, they don't want to be pictured with them on the podiums. And it's it's extraordinarily controversial. I think it's um, officially only 16 Russian and Belarusians have accepted the invitations to participate in, in Paris in the Olympics. But unofficially, as, as Abdul has mentioned, unofficially, there are actually dozens more that have kind of taken a different nationality to be able to compete. And, and I do think it, it's difficult to make the argument like the Kremlin did, that sport is nothing to do with politics when you're representing a nation. It's one thing if you're competing as an individual, but when you're representing a nation in a, in a competition of nations, it does raise the question of what does that mean? 
I think that's such an important point. Big sporting tournaments often become reflections of the world's political conflicts. Rebecca, is there a, a risk that we're inflaming a sense of international competition rather than spreading peace or whatever the IOC reckons it's doing? Yeah, I think the Olympics is inherently political. And as as Harriet's briefly touched upon, you know, dozens of Russian born athletes have been able to compete this year by acquiring new nationalities. And that's a essentially a backdoor to avoiding the sanctions on Russia. Obviously, that's that's caused a lot of issues within Russia. I mean, Russian commentators have called these people acquiring new nationalities, the lost generation. And a lot of politicians within Russia have expressed um, extreme disapproval, shall we say, of, of, of such measures. The chairman of the state Duma Committee on Sports said that the achievements of our athletes were made thanks to Russia, Russian and Soviet sports schools. Um, and the country has invested resources, potential and knowledge into these individuals. So he's not very happy about this situation. And in that sense, I can kind of see um, his his point. But yeah, we can't separate, just like we can't separate politics from Eurovision. We can't separate politics from the Olympics. We can't separate politics from any event that happens on the world stage. There's always going to be some form of conflict that is happening around the world, whether that's Russia and Ukraine, Israel, Palestine. This event is inherently political. We have to lean into that to a certain extent. But I think that when rules are made within the Olympics or any other competition, whether that be sporting or otherwise, I think they have to be fair across the board rather than uh, spotlighting certain issues above others. On a lighter note then, what has been your favourite moment of the Olympics so far, Harriet? I mean, every single thing that Simone Biles has done, I'm, I'm team Simone Biles. If, if there was a Simone Biles team, that would be the one that I would be supporting. <laughs> well, that was a truly Olympian effort all round team. My thanks to Harriet, Rebecca and Abdul. And you can follow this show for free and get every episode as soon as it's released by searching for The Week Unwrapped, wherever you get your podcasts and tapping follow. And you can get six free issues of The Week magazine with a trial subscription. Just go to theweek.com slash Subscriptions. In the meantime, I've been Arian McNichol. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Izzy Bujard at Rethink Audio. And until we meet again to unwrap next week, bye bye. Hold up. 